Okay, we are back with our Hatchet Read Aloud by Gary Paulson. Today we are reading chapters 7, 8, and 9. Chapter 7 Mother! He screamed it, and he could not be sure if the scream awakened him or in the pain of his stomach. His whole abdomen was torn with great rolling jolts of pain, pain that doubled him in the darkness and of the little shelter, put him face over and face down in the sand to moan again and again, Mother, mother, mother. Never anything like this, never. It was as if all the berries, all the pits had exploded in the center of him, ripped and tore at him. He crawled out the doorway and was sick in the sand, then crawled still farther and was sick again, vomiting and with terrible diarrhea for over an hour, for over a year, he thought, until he was at last empty and drained of all strength. Then he crawled back into the shelter and fell again to the sand, but could not sleep at first, could do nothing except lie there, and his mind decided then to bring the memory up again. In the mall, every detail, his mother sitting in the station wagon with the man, and she had leaned across and kissed him, kissed the man with the short blonde hair, and it was not a friendly peck, but a kiss. A kiss where she turned her head over at an angle and put her mouth against the mouth of the blonde man who was not his father, and kissed, mouth to mouth, and then brought her hand up to touch his cheek, his forehead, while they were kissing, and Brian saw it. Saw this thing that his mother did with the blonde man. Saw the kiss that became the secret that his father still did not know about, know all about. The memory was so real that he could feel the heat in the mall that day, could remember the worry that Terry would turn and see his mother, could remember the worry of the shame of it, and then the memory faded, and he slept again. Awake. For a second, perhaps two, he did not know where he was, was still in his sleep somewhere. Then he saw the sun streaming in the open doorway of the shelter and heard the close, vicious whine of the mosquitoes, and knew. He brushed his face, completely welted now with two days of bites, completely covered with lumps and bites, and was surprised to find the swelling on his forehead had gone down a great deal. It was almost gone. The smell was awful, and he couldn't place it. Then he saw the pile of berries at the back of the shelter and remembered the night and being sick. Too many of them, he said out loud. Too many gut cherries. He crawled out of the shelter and found where he'd messed the sand. He used sticks and cleaned it as best as he could, covered it with clean sand, and went down to the lake to wash his hands and get a drink. It was still very early, only was just past true dawn, and the water was so calm he could see his reflection. It frightened him. The face was cut and bleeding, swollen and lumpy, the hair all matted, and on his forehead a cut had re- healed but left the hair stuck with blood and scab. His eyes were slits in the bites, and he was somehow covered with dirt. He slapped the water with his hand to destroy the mirror. Ugly, he thought. Very, very ugly. And he was, at that moment, almost overcome with self-pity. He was dirty and starving and bitten and hurt and lonely and ugly and afraid and so completely miserable that it was like being in a pit, a dark, deep pit with no way out. He sat back on the bank and fought crying, then let it come and cried for perhaps three, four minutes. Long tears, self-pity tears, wasted tears. He stood, went back to the water, and took small drinks. As soon as the cold water hit his stomach, he felt the hunger sharpen, as it had before, and he stood and held his abdomen until the hunger cramps receded. He had to eat. He was weak with it again, down with the hunger, and he had to eat. Back at the shelter, the berries lay in a pile where he had dumped them when he grabbed his windbreaker. Gut cherries, he called them in his mind now and he thought of eating some of them. Not a crazy amount, as he had, which he felt brought on the sickness in the night, but just enough to stay, to stave off the hunger a bit. He crawled into the shelter. Some flies were on the berries, and he brushed them off. He selected only the berries that were solidly ripe, not the light red ones, but the berries that were dark, maroon red to black, and swollen in ripeness. When he had a small handful of them, he went back down to the lake and washed them in the water. Small fish scattered away when he splashed the water up, and he wished he had a fishing line and hook. 
Then he ate them carefully, spitting out the pits. They were still tart, but had a sweetness to them, although they seemed to make his lips a bit numb. When he finished, he was still hungry, but the edge was gone and his legs didn't feel as weak as they had. He went back to the shelter. It took him half an hour to go through the rest of the berries and sort them, putting all the fully ripe ones in a pile on some leaves, the rest in another pile. When he was done, he covered the two piles with grass he tore from the lake shore to keep the flies off and went back outside. They were, there were, they were awful berries, those gut cherries, he thought, but there was food here, some food of some kind, and he could eat a bit more later tonight if he had to. For now, he had a full day ahead of him. He looked at the sky through the trees and saw that while there were clouds, they were scattered and did not seem to hold rain. There was a light breeze that seemed to keep the mosquitoes down. Then he thought, looking up the lake shore, if there was one kind of berry, there should be other kinds, sweeter kinds. If he kept the lake in sight, as he had done yesterday, he should be all right, should be able to find home again. And it stopped him. He had actually thought of this that time. Home. Three days? No, two. Or was it three? Yes, this was the third day, and he had thought of the shelter as home. He turned and looked at it, studied the crude work. The brush made a fair wall, not weather tight, but it cut most of the wind off. He hadn't done so badly at that. Maybe it wasn't much, but also it was all he had for a home. All right, he thought, so I'll call it home. He turned back and set off up the side of the lake, heading for the cut gut cherry brushes, his windbreaker bag in his hand. Things were bad, he thought, but maybe not that bad. Maybe he could find some better berries. When he came to the gut cherry bushes, he paused. The branches were empty of birds, but still had many berries, and some of those that had been merely red yesterday were now a dark maroon to black, much riper. Maybe he should stay and pick them to save them. But the explosion in the night was still much in his memory, and he decided to go on. Gut cherries were food, but tricky to eat. He needed something better. Another hundred yards up the shore, there was a place where the wind had torn another path. These must have been fierce winds, he thought, to tear up places like this, as they had the path he had found with the plane when he crashed. Here the trees were not all the way down, but twisted and snapped off half halfway up from the ground, so their tops were all down and rotted and gone, leaving the snakes poking into the sky like broken teeth. It made for tons of dead and dry wood, and he wished once more he could get a fire going. It also made a kind of clearing with the tops of the trees gone. The sun could get down to the ground, and it was filled with small, thorny bushes that were covered with berries. Raspberries. These he knew because they were, there were some raspberry bushes in the park, and he and Terry were always picking and eating them when they biked past. The berries were full and ripe, and he tasted one to find it sweet, and with none of the problems of the gut cherries. Although, he did not grow, although they did not grow in clusters, there were many of them, and they were easy to pick, and Brian smiled and started eating. Sweet juice, he thought. Oh, they were sweet with just a tiny tang, and he picked and ate and picked and ate and thought that he had never tasted anything this good. Soon, as before, his stomach was full, but now he had some sense and he did not gorge and cram more down. Instead, he picked more and put them in his windbreaker, feeling the morning sun on his back and thinking he was rich, rich with food now just rich, and he heard a noise to his rear, a slight noise, and he turned and saw the bear. He could do nothing, think nothing. His tongue, stained with berry juice, stuck to the roof of his mouth, and he stared at the bear. It was black, with a cinnamon-colored nose, t not twenty feet from him, and big. Not huge. It was all black fur and huge. He had seen one in the zoo in the city once, a black bear, but it had been from India or somewhere. This one was wild and much bigger than the one in the zoo, and it was right there, right there. The sun caught the ends of the hairs along its back. Shiny black and silver, silky, the bear stood on its hind legs, half up, and studied Brian, just studied him, then lowered itself and moved slowly to the left, eating berries as it rolled along, waffling and delicately using its mouth to lift each berry from the stem, and in seconds it was gone, gone and Brian still had not moved. His tongue was stuck to the top of his mouth, the tip half out. His eyes were wide, and his hands were reaching for a berry. 
Then he made a sound, a low n. Mm? It made no sense. It was just a sound of fear, of disbelief that something that large could have come so close to him without his knowing. It just walked up to him and could have eaten him, and he could have done nothing, nothing. And when the sound was half done, a thing happened to his legs, a thing he had nothing to do with, and they were running in the opposite direction from the bear, back toward the shelter. He would have run all the way in panic, but after he had gone perhaps 50 yards, his brain took over and slowed and finally stopped them. If the bear had wanted you, his brain said, he would have taken you. It is something to understand, he thought, not something to run away from. The bear was eating berries, not people. The bear made no move to hurt you, to threaten you. It stood to see you better, study you, then went on its way eating berries. It was a big bear, but it did not want you did not want to cause you harm, and that is the thing to understand here. He turned and looked back at the stand of raspberries. The bear was gone. The birds were singing. He saw nothing that could hurt him. There was no danger here that he could sense, could feel. In the city at night, there was sometimes danger. You could not be in the park at night, after dark, because of the danger. But here, the bear had looked at him and had moved on, and this filled his thoughts. The berries were so good, so good. So sweet and rich, and his body was so empty, and the bear had almost indicated that it didn't mind sharing, had just walked from him. And the berries were so good. And he thought, finally, if he did not go back and get the berries, he would have to eat the gut cherries again tonight. That convinced him, and he walked slowly back to the raspberry patch and continued picking for the entire morning, although with great caution. And once, when a squirrel wrestled some pine needles at the base of a tree, he nearly jumped out of his skin. About noon, the sun was almost straight overhead. The clouds began to thicken and look dark. In moments, it started to rain, and he took what he had and picked and trotted back to the shelter. He had eaten probably two pounds of raspberries and had maybe another three pounds in his jacket, rolled in a pouch. He made it to the shelter just as the clouds completely opened and the rain wore down in sheets. Soon, the sand outside was drenched and there were rivets running down the lake. But inside he was dry and snug. He started to put the picked berries back in the sorted pile with the gut cherries, but noticed that the raspberries were seeping through the jacket. They were much softer than the gut cherries, and apparently were being crushed a bit with their own weight. When he held the jacket up and looked beneath it, he saw a stream of red liquid. He put a finger in it and found it to be sweet and tangy, like pop without the fuzz or the fizz. And he grinned and lay back on the sand holding the bag up over his face and letting the seepage drip into his mouth. Outside, the rain poured down, but Brian lay back, drinking syrup from the berries, dry and with the pain almost gone, the stiffness almost gone, his belly full and a good taste in his mouth. For the first time since the crash, he was not thinking of himself or his own life. Brian was wondering if the bear was as surprised as he was to find another being in the berries. Later in the afternoon, as evening came down, he went to the lake and washed the sticky berry juice from his face and hands. Then he went back to prepare for the night. While he had accepted and understood that the bear did not want to hurt him, it was still much in his thoughts, and as darkness came into the shelter, he took the hatchet out of his belt and put it by his head, his hand on the handle, as the day caught up with him, and he slept. Chapter 8 At first he thought it was a growl. In the still darkness of the shelter, in the middle of the night, his eyes came open and he was awake and he thought there was a growl. But it was the wind, a medium wind in the pines that had made some sound that brought him up, brought him awake. He sat up and was hit with the smell. It terrified him. The smell was one of rot, some musty rot that made him think only of graves with cobwebs and dust and old death. His nostrils widened and he opened his eyes wider, but he could see nothing. It was too dark, too hard dark, with clouds covering even the small light from the stars, and he could not see. But the smell was alive, alive and full and in the shelter. He thought of the bear, thought of Bigfoot, and every monster he had ever seen in every fright movie he had ever watched, and his heart hammered in his throat. Then he heard the slithering, a brushing sound, a slithering brushing sound near his feet, and he kicked out as hard as he could, kicked out and threw the hatchet at the sound, a noise coming from his throat. 
but the hatchet missed, sailed into the wall where it hit the rocks with a shower of sparks, and his leg was instantly torn with pain as if a hundred needles had been driven into it. Ah! Now he screamed with the pain and fear and skittered up his backside up into the corner of the shelter, breathing through his mouth, straining to see, to hear. The slithering moved again. He thought tore him at first, and terror took him, stopping his breath. He felt he could see a low, dark form, a bulk in the di darkness, a shadow that lived, but now it moved away. Slithering and scraping, it moved away, and he saw, or thought he saw it, go out the door of the opening. He lay on his side for a moment, then pulled a rasping breath in and held it, listening for the attacker to return. When it was apparent that the shadow wasn't coming back, he felt the calf of his leg, where the pain was centered and spreading to fill the whole leg. His fingers gingerly gingerly touched a group of needles that had been driven through his pants and into the fleshy part of his calf. They were stiff and very sharp on the ends that stuck out, and he knew when the what the attacker had been. A porcupine had stumbled into his shelter, and when he had kicked it, the thing had slapped him with its tail of quills. He touched each quill carefully. The, main, the pain made it seem as if a dozen of them had been slammed into his leg, but there were only eight pinning the cloth against his skin. He leaned back against the wall for a minute. He couldn't leave them in. They had to come out, but just touching them made the pain so much more intense. So fast, he thought. So fast things change. When he got to sleep, he had satisfaction, and in just a moment, it was all different. He grasped one of the quills, held his breath, and jerked. It sent pain signals to his brain in tight waves, but he grabbed another, pulled it, then another quill. When he had pulled four of them, he stopped for a moment. The pain had gone from being a pointed injury pain to spreading in a hot smear up his leg, and it made him catch his breath. Some of the quills were driven in deeper than others, and they tore when they came out. His breath deeply, his, he breathed deeply twice, let half of the breath out, and went back to work. Jerk, pause, jerk, and three more times before he lay back in the darkness, done. The pain filled his leg now, and with it came new waves of self-pity. Sitting alone in the dark, his leg aching, some mosquitoes finding him again, he started crying. It was all too much, just too much, and he couldn't take it, not the way it was. I can't take it this way, alone with no fire, and in the dark, and next time it might be something worse, maybe a bear, and it wouldn't just be quills in his leg, it would be worse. I can't do this, he thought again and again. I can't. Brian pulled himself up <clears throat> until he was sitting upright back in the corner of the cave. He put his head down on his arms across his knees, with stiffness taking his left leg, and cried until he was all cried out. He did not know how long it took, but later he looked back on this time of crying in the corner of the dark cave and thought of it as when he learned the most important rule of survival, which was that feeling sorry for yourself didn't work. It wasn't just that it was wrong to do or that it was considered incorrect. It was more than that. It didn't work. When he sat alone in the darkness and cried and was done, all done with it, nothing had changed. His leg still hurt, it was still dark, and he was still alone, and the self-pity had accomplished nothing. At last, he slept again, but already his patterns were changing. And the sleep was light, a resting doze more than a deep sleep, with small sounds awakening him twice in the rest of the night. In the last doze period before daylight, before he awakened, finally with the morning light and the clouds of new mosquitoes, he dreamed. This time, it was not of his mother, not of the secret, but of his father at first, and then of his friend Terry. In the initial segment of the dream, his father was standing at the side of the living room, looking at him, and it was clear from his expression that he was trying to tell Brian something. His lips moved, but there was no sound, not a whisper. He waved his hands at Brian, made gestures in front of his face as if he were scratching something, and he had worked to make a word with his mouth, but at first Brian couldn't see it. Then the lips made a mmm shape, but no sound came. Mmm. Brian could not hear it, could not understand it. He wanted to so badly. It was so important to understand his father, to know that he was saying, he was trying to help, trying so hard, and when Brian couldn't understand, he looked across, the way he did when Brian had asked questions more than once, and he faded. 
Brian's father faded into a fog place Brian could not see, and the dream was almost over, or it seemed to be, when Terry came. He was not gesturing to Brian, but was sitting in the park at a bench, looking at a barbecue pit, and for a time nothing happened. Then he got up and poured some charcoal from a big bag into the cooker, then some starter fluid, and he took a flick type of lighter and lit the fluid. When it was burning and the charcoal was at last getting hot, he turned, noticing Brian for the first time in the dream. He turned and smiled and pointed to the fire as if to say, See? A fire. But it meant nothing to Brian, except that he wished he had a fire. He saw a grocery sack on the table next to Terry. Brian thought it must contain hot dogs and chips and mustard, and he could think only of food. But Terry shook his head and pointed again to the fire, and twice more he put into the fire, made Brian see the flames, and Brian felt his frustration and anger rise, and he thought, all right, all right, I see the fire, but so what? I don't have a fire. I know about fire. I know I need a fire. I know that. His eyes opened, and there was light in the cave, a gray, dim light of morning. He wiped his mouth and tried to move his leg, which had stiffened like wood. There was thirst and hunger, and he ate some raspberries from the jacket. They had spoiled a bit, seemed softer and mushier, but still had the rich sweetness. He crushed the berries against the roof of his mouth with his tongue and drank the sweet juice as it ran down his throat. A flash of metal caught his eye, and he saw his hatchet in the sand where he had thrown it at the porcupine in the dark. He scooched up, wincing a bit, when he bent his stiff leg and crawled to where the hatchet lay. He picked it up and examined it and saw a chip in the top of the head. The nick wasn't too large, but the hatchet was important to him. Not his, it was his only tool, and he should not have thrown it. He should keep it in his hand and make a tool of some kind to help push an animal away. Make a staff, he thought, or a lance to say and save the hatchet. Something came then, a thought as he held the hatchet. Something about the dream and his father and Terry, but he couldn't pin it down. Ah! He scrambled out and stood in the morning sun and stretched his back muscles and his sore leg. The hatchet was still in his hand, and as he stretched and raised it over his head, it caught the first rays of the morning sun. The first faint light hit the silver of the hatchet, and it flashed a brilliant gold in the light, like fire. That is it, he thought, when they were, what they were trying to tell me. Fire. The hatchet was the key to it all. When he threw the hatchet at the porcupine in the cave and missed, it hit the stone wall, and it showered sparks, a golden shower of sparks in the dark, as golden with fire as the sun was now. The hatchet was the answer. That's what his father and Terry had been trying to tell him. Somehow he could get fire from the hatchet. The sparks would make fire. Brian went back into the shelter and studied the wall. It was some form of chalky granite or a sandstone, but embedded in it were large pieces of a darker stone, a harder and darker stone. It only took him a moment to find where the hatchet had struck. The steel had nicked into the edge of one of the darker stone pieces. Brian turned the head backward so he could strike with the flat rear of the hatchet and hit the black rock gently, too gently, and nothing happened. He struck harder, a glancing blow, and two or three weak sparks skipped off the rock and died immediately. He swung harder, held the hatchet so it hit a longer, sliding blow, and the black rock exploded in fire. The sparks flew so heavily that several of them skittered and jumped on the sand beneath the rock, and he smiled and struck again and again. There could be fire here, he thought. I will have a fire here, he thought, and struck again. I will have fire from the hatchet. Chapter 9 Brian found it was a long way from sparks to fire. Clearly, there had been something for the sparks to ignite, some kind of tinder or kindling, but what? He brought some dried grass in, taped sparks into it, and watched them die. He tried small twigs, breaking them into little pieces, but that was worse than the grass. Then he tried a combination of the two, grass and twigs. Nothing. He had no trouble getting sparks, but the tiny bits of hot stone or metal, he couldn't tell which they were, just sputtered and died. He needed something finer, something soft and fine and fluffy to catch the bits of fire. Shredded paper would be nice, but he had no paper. So close, he said aloud. So close. He put the hatchet back in his belt and went out of the shelter, limping on his sore leg. There had to be something. Had to be. Man had made fire. There had been fire for thousands, millions of years. 
There had to be a way. He dug into his pockets and found the $20 bill in his wallet. Paper. Worthless paper out here, but if he could get a fire going... He ripped the twenty into tiny pieces, made a pile of pieces, and hit sparks into them. Nothing happened. They just wouldn't take the sparks. But there had to be a way, some way to do it. Not twenty feet to his right, leaning out over the water were birches, and he stood looking at them for a full half minute before they registered in his mind. They were a beautiful white with bark like clean, slightly speckled paper. Paper. He moved to the trees, where the bark was peeling from the trunks. It lifted its tiny tendrils, almost fluffs. Brian plucked some of them loose, rolled them in his fingers. They seemed flammable, dry, and nearly powdery. He pulled and twisted bits off the trees, packing them in one hand while he picked them with the other, picking and gathering until he had a wad close to the size of a baseball. Then he went back into the shelter and arranged the ball of birch bark peeling at the base of the black rock. As an afterthought, he threw in the remnants of the $20 bill. He struck, and a stream of sparks fell into the bark and quickly died. But this time, one spark fell on one small hair of the dry bark, almost a thread of bark, and seemed to glow a bit brighter than before it died. The material had to be finer. There had to be a soft and incredibly fine nest for the sparks. It must make a home. I must make a home for the sparks, he thought. A perfect home, or they won't stay. They won't make fire. He started ripping the bark, using his fingernails at first. Then when that didn't work, he used the sharp edge of the hatchet, cutting the bark in thin slivers, hair so fine they were almost not there. It was painstaking work, slow work, and he stayed at it with over two hours. Twice he stopped for a handful of berries and once to go to the lake for a drink, then back to work the sun on his back until at last he had a ball of fluff as big as a grapefruit, dry birch bark fluff. He positioned his spark nest, and as he thought of it, at the base of the rock, used his thumb to make a small depression in the middle, and slammed the back of his hatchet down across the black rock. A cloud of sparks rained down, most of them missing the nest, but some, perhaps thirty or so, hit the depression, and one of those six or seven found fuel and grew smoldering and caused the bark to take on the red glow. Then it went out. Close. He was so close. He repositioned the nest, made a new and smaller dent with his thumb, and struck again. More sparks, a slight glow, then nothing. It's me, he thought. I'm doing something wrong. I do not know this. A cave dweller would have had a fire by now. A crow of Magon man would have a fire by now. But I don't know this. I don't know how to make a fire. Maybe not enough sparks. He settled the nest in place once more and hit the rock with a series of blows as fast as he could. The sparks flowed like a golden waterfall. At first they seemed to take. There were several, many sparks that found life and took briefly, but they all died. Starved. He leaned back. They are like me. They are starving. It wasn't quantity. There were plenty of sparks, but they needed more. I would kill, he thought suddenly, for a book of matches. Just one book, just one match I would kill. What makes fire? He thought back to school, to all those science classes. Had he ever learned what made a fire? Did a teacher ever stand up and say, this is what a fire makes, or this is what fi- makes a fire? He stood his head, he shook his head, tried to focus his thoughts. What did it take? You have to have fuel, he thought, and he had that. The bark was fuel oxygen. There had to be air. He needed to add air. He had to fan on it, blow on it. He made the nest ready again, held the hatchet backward, tensed, and struck four quick blows. Sparks came down, and he leaned forward as fast as he could and blew. Too hard. There was a bright, almost intense glow, and then it was gone. He had blown it out. Another set of strikes, more sparks. He leaned and blew, but gently this time holding back and aiming the stream of air from his mouth to hit the brightest spot. Five or six sparks had fallen in a tight mass of bark hair, and Brian centered his efforts there. The sparks grew with his gentle breath. The red glow moved from the sparks themselves into the bark, moved and grew and became worms, glowing red worms that crawled up the bark hairs and cut other threads of bark, and grew until there was a pocket of red as big as a quarter, a glowing red coal of heat. 
and when he ran out of breath and paused to inhale, the red ball suddenly burst into flame. Fire! he yelled. I've got fire! I've got it! I've got it! I've got it! But the flames were thick and oily and burning fast, consuming the ball of bark as fast as if it were gasoline. He had to feed the flames, keep them going. Working as fast as he could, he carefully placed the dried grass and wood pieces he had tried at first on top of the bark and was gratified to see them take. But they would go fast. He needed more and more. He could not let the flames go out. He ran from the shelter into the pines and started breaking off the low, dead, small limbs. These he threw in the shelter, went back for more, threw those in, and squatted to break and feed the hungry flames. When the small wood was going well, he went out and found larger wood and did not relax until that was going. Then he leaned back against the wood brace of his door opening and smiled. I have a friend, he thought. I have a friend now. A hungry friend, but a good friend. I have a friend named Fire. Hello, Fire. The curve of the rock back made an almost perfect drawing fuel that carried the smoke up through the cracks of the roof but held the heat. If he kept the fire small, it would be perfect. It would keep anything like the porcupine from coming through the door again. A friend and a guard, he thought. So much from a little spark. A friend and a guard from a tiny spark. He looked around and wished he had somebody to tell this thing, to show this thing he had done. But there was nobody. Nothing but the trees and the sun and the breeze and the lake. Nobody. And he thought rolling thoughts with the smoke curling up over his head and the smile still half on his face he thought I wonder what they're doing now I wonder what my father is doing now I wonder what my mother is doing now I wonder if she is with him